here we're gonna here we're diving back into a very old series which I haven't worked on in a while but I think I'm ready to dive back into and eventually finish and that is the series on differential forms leading towards the generalized Stokes theorem and in this video today we're gonna look at a proof of a very special case of this theorem but this very special case will actually pretty easily lead to the general case just with a couple more bits of machinery which we'll do in forthcoming videos. Okay, so let's see exactly what we're gonna prove in this video. So let's suppose that omega is the following n minus one form on Rn. So it's f dx2 wedge dx3 wedge all the way up to dxn where f is a function of n variables and it's differentiable. Furthermore, we have r, which is our n-dimensional unit square. Then the generalized Stokes theorem in this case simplifies to the following statement. So we have the integral over the boundary of the square, we'll call that del r of omega, is equal to the integral over the square of d omega, which, where this is the so-called exterior derivative, which we did in previous videos. Now I just want to point out that this left-hand integral is the integral of an n minus 1 form on an n minus 1 chain, whereas this right integral is the integral of an n form on an n chain. Okay, so let's look at some of the simplifications that we've made before we move on to our proof. First is that an arbitrary n minus 1 form on Rn is actually a linear combination of things that looks like this. So I'll call it eta because we've already used omega and it's the sum as i goes from one to n of fi where that's a differentiable function with n variables. And then we have dx1 wedge all the way up to dxn where we have removed dxi. And I'd like to point out that this removal is done with this fairly standard notation of putting a hat over it. And now generalizing to this case from what we prove in this video is actually going to be pretty easy because of linearity. So you would just need to prove this thing for this general thing right here where the dxi has been removed, which will actually be a nice homework exercise based on what we do here. And then again, the extension is linear. So our second simplification is based on the fact that we eventually want an n minus one form. So omega will be an n minus one form on Rm, where m is bigger than or equal to n. That's because we want an n chain in Rm instead of an n chain in Rn. And so this will be achieved later via the notion of a pullback, which we'll do in a forthcoming video. And this will actually make this result quite a bit more powerful than it originally seems. Next, eventually we want to integrate over an arbitrary n chain instead of this n rectangle or this n square. But again, that's going to be later achieved with pullbacks. Okay, so now that we've like looked at these observations and we see what we need to prove, let's jump into the proof. Okay, so I hope we've appropriately motivated the simplifications that we've made. Now we're going to jump into this special proof of this case of the generalized Stokes theorem. So let's fix a natural number n and eventually we'll take the limit as this n goes to infinity. So I'll call this capital N because we have reserved our lowercase n for the dimension that we're working in. And then for a multi-index i, which will be i1, i2, all the way up to i n, we'll set x underscore this capital I equal to i1 over n, i2 over n all the way up to i n over n. So this is going to be a point in this unit hypercube. Okay, and then next let's observe that 1 over n times the unit basis vector ej is in fact just zeros and then a 1 over n and then a bunch of other zeros where this one over n is happening at the jth component. And then let's gather one more part. So let's note that d omega, the exterior derivative of this n minus one form, well, that's gonna be an n form. And we calculate that 
by taking all of the partials of f with respect to x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn, and then wedging x1, x2, all the way up to xn with this basic simple form right here. But everything collapses except for the x1 component, because whenever you wedge like xj with xj, you get zero, as we saw in previous videos. So this ends up being the partial of f with respect to x1, and then we have dx1 wedge all the way up to dxn. Okay, nice. And now that we've got all of these parts, we're ready to write down this right-hand side of our generalized Stokes theorem, so that integral. So let's do the integral over r of d omega. So we can write that as a limit of a Riemann sum. So that's gonna be the limit as this capital N goes to infinity. And then we have the sum as ij goes from one up to capital N. And then this j is running between one and N. And then we have d omega. And then this is going to be evaluated at xi star. We'll talk exactly what we mean by xi star in just a second. And then at the collection of vectors, one over n e1, one over n e2, all the way up to one over n e n. Let's recall that d omega is an n form and it has like two types of inputs. So you input a point here and then you input a collection of n n vectors there. Okay, so now that we've got this taken care of, let's maybe point out where this xi star comes from. So this xi star will be somewhere on the interval i1 over n to i1 plus 1 over n cross i2 over n to i2 plus 1 over n cross dot dot dot. So you can imagine it as being inside of one of the sub hypercubes that's in the larger cube. Okay, nice. Okay, but now we can replace this with d omega expressed via the definition of the exterior derivative. So we have this limit as our capital N goes to infinity of the sum as ij goes from one up to capital N and then j is going from one to N and then we have partial f, partial x1, and then we have dx1 wedge all the way up to dxn, and then it's gonna be evaluated at this set of vectors again. So one over n e1 all the way up to one over n en. Okay, so now let's take this equation, bring it to the top, and then we're actually just a few couple of steps to ending at this left-hand side. So far, we've ended up at the following spot. Now we're ready to use the trick that we actually use in the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus, along with the definition of what it means to evaluate this simple n form on this collection of n vectors. Let's maybe use this proof from the fundamental theorem of calculus first, and that is to choose this xi star in a way so that the mean value theorem applies. So remember that this xi star was really chosen kind of arbitrarily, and we could do that because we have this limit along with kind of the definition of the integral over this form. But now we can, like I said, apply the mean, the mean value theorem. So now we have this limit as capital N goes to infinity. And then we have the sum as ij goes from one up to capital N. One is less than or equal to j, which is less than or equal to N. That should be a lowercase there. And then here we have f. Now I'm gonna write this as follows. So we've got i1 plus one over n, comma i2 all the way up to i n, and then minus f of x i. Let's recall that f of x i was exactly this, except we had an i1 here instead of an i1 plus one. Okay, so again, that's using the mean value theorem given the fact that we're taking the derivative with respect to x one. Okay, but now we've got to divide that by the length of the interval, but the length of the interval is one over n. Okay, so that's good. So let's maybe notate that, that we were able to make this replacement here 
by just the plain old mean value theorem that you might learn in calculus one. Obviously a little bit more is going on here, but that's essentially as simple as it is. Okay, and so now we can use definition of evaluation of n forms to simplify that a little bit, given that these vectors have such a nice form. Okay, so here we're gonna get dx2 wedge all the way up to dxn, and then it'll be e2 over n all the way up to en over n. And then we can do that if we put a n in the denominator here. Okay, so how did we do that? Well, I'll let you guys review what it takes to evaluate an n form and an n minus one form. And it actually follows pretty quickly that these are equal. Like I said, this is just by evaluation of forms, which we did quite a while ago. Okay, but now let's notice that this n and this one over n will cancel, which is good because we're starting to get some simplification. So that's nice. And then furthermore, if we look at just the sum over I1, so notice that there are n sums here, and if we just look at the I1 sum, we have a telescoping situation. And that's because if we recall, this guy right here, this Xi is I1 over N all the way up to IN over N. So that telescopes, and what does it telescope to? Well, let's bring all of the rest of the parts down. We'll have this limit as n goes to infinity, and then the sum as ij goes from one up to n, and now j will be running between two and n instead of one and n, because we're doing that one summation. Again, it telescopes, and it's gonna telescope to f evaluated at one, Oh, and I just realized these should all be over n as well. And then we have i2 over n all the way up to i n over n, and then minus f evaluated at zero, and then i2 over n all the way up to i n over n. And that's because those are the end points. That's the like maybe i zero and the i one term. Okay, and then we're finally still gonna be left with this stuff on the outside. So this is dx2 wedge all the way up to dxn evaluated at this e2 over n all the way up to en over n. Okay, so I think things are starting to shape up here. But now notice that we can distribute the sum across each of these parts and we have an n minus one integral at the point where this first component is equal to one and when this second component is equal to one. So we could maybe write that as the integral of omega over the set one cross zero one to the n minus one, where notice the first component is one, and it's, then that's minus the integral of omega over zero cross zero one to the n minus one like that. Okay. So now we're running out of room, so let's bring that up, and then we're actually almost done. Okay, on the last board, we ended up with the following equation, which looks very, very close to what we want. So I'm gonna put these together before we argue that this is actually exactly what we want. So we could rewrite this as the integral over the doubleton zero one cross 0, 1 to the n minus 1 of omega. And I'm going to point out that this point 0 is negatively oriented, whereas this point 1 is positively oriented. That gives us a plus sign here and a minus sign here. But now I want to argue that this is in fact equal to the integral of omega over the boundary of R. But you might say that the boundary of R actually includes a bunch of other stuff. Like notice the boundary of R definitely is equal to this. So zero negatively oriented, one positively oriented cross zero one to the N minus one, but it also includes the sides. So you can think of this as the top and the bottom of this hypercube, but there are also a bunch of sides of this hypercube as well. So what about for instance, zero one cross 
zero negatively oriented, one positively oriented, cross zero one to the n minus two, cross dot dot dot. So that would be one of the other sides. But let's notice that because of our definition of omega, which has dx2 up to dxn, anything like this will give us a zero because any vector that is contained in a set like this will be parallel to the x2 axis in this case, or really the xi axis, depending on which side we're taking off. But if we've got a vector which is tangent to one of those axes and we plug it into this form, we'll get zero. So that means that going from here to here involves just realizing that omega evaluated on things like this will be equal to zero. Okay, so I think in forthcoming videos, we'll obviously work towards the proof of this general theorem using pullbacks. But before we do that, we'll work through a couple of like explicit examples of this generalized Stokes theorem working. And that's a good place to stop.